So of all of those nature philosophers that you read about, what was the only one whose name was familiar to you beforehand? Pythagoras. Pythagoras. And why do you all know Pythagoras? Because of the Pythagorean theorem. Can everybody recite the Pythagorean theorem? Let's do it. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Exactly. The holy theorem of Pythagoras. The one thing I can still count on high school graduates still knowing. What is the Pythagorean theorem? What is it good for? What is it useful? Something about triangles, any kind of triangle? Something about right triangles, what about them? Right, if you got two sides, you can use the Pythagorean theorem to find the length of another side. So let's say we've got a triangle right? And we know that this side is 3 and this side is 4. We're trying to find out this side. So what's the Pythagorean theorem again? We have a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So if a is 3 squared plus b 4 squared equals c squared, what's 3 squared? 9. Nine. What's 4 squared? What's it? Okay, equals c squared. We got to get c by itself. How do we get that little doohickey off there? We take the square root of both sides. All right, so this gets c by itself. And then 9 plus 16 was 25, and the square root of 25 is 5. So our hypotenuse equals 5. Boom. Very good. You remembered how to apply the Pythagorean theorem. Why does this work? Don't know? It works because your ninth grade geometry teacher told you it would work, right? And you all dutifully, like good students, memorize the theorem and you know how to apply it. Let me ask you something. How many of y'all hate math? Several of y'all hate math. You know why you hate math? I can tell you why. My very first job teaching was when I was a student at Valencia, like you, and I uh, tutored at the West Campus Tutoring Center. And I mostly tutored algebra and geometry students. And I quickly figured out why it is that so many people hate math. You know why? Because you don't know what the hell you're doing. And I mean that very literally, very directly. You know how to memorize things and how to process them down, but you don't know what you're actually doing when you do this. You're just going through a series of memorized steps. Now, I was fortunate because I had Mrs. Booth for eighth grade math class. And Mrs. Booth did not let us memorize our way and play number voodoo to try to pop out some mathematical answers. She made sure we actually understood what we were doing. And I can still remember the day that she explained the Pythagorean theorem. First of all, what you're seeing right here, this is not reality, that is symbolism. Reality is an actual triangle. Now, when we say that three and four and square and do all that, what, what are we really doing here? First of all, we're saying that, okay, if A is three, then three squared, why do we say squared? Why not three to the little, what does three to the little two mean? Multiplied by itself. So why don't we just say three self times z? Why do we say squared? Because we're making a square, we're taking a two dimensional length and we're, and we're squaring it. We're taking it, uh, we're taking it from uh, one to the second dimension. Uh, okay, so let's just start with the basics here, three. That is not three. That is a symbol for three. This is three. Or this is three. One, two, three, an extension of line. So when we say this side squared, we say three squared, what we're doing is taking this one dimensional line and stretching it out into the second dimension or making a square out of it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. If my length is three, when I square it, I make nine squares. That's why three squared is nine. That's physical reality. That is symbolism expressing that reality. Thing about Greek mathematics is that they did not have a very good symbolic system for describing what they were doing. The Greeks were very good at geometry, but it was direct applied geometry. They didn't have these convenient little symbols that we have. Most of that stuff 
comes from Arabic mathematicians in the Middle Ages or beyond that in the time of you know, Newton. Um, so, so they were wrestling with actual physical lines. They were using their letters of their alphabet to express mathematical ratios, one of which is still very commonly known today. We still use the Greek letter pi to describe one of those problematic ratios. Um, so they're wrestling with it, but we, we'll go ahead and use our modern mathematical symbolism to finish describing this. We said that this was four, and so when we square this side, we end up with how many squares? Four squared is 16. Now when we say a squared plus b squared equals c squared, what we're saying really is that a squared, all those squares, plus all of these squares are going to equal all the squares on the other side. So we've got nine so far. Let's keep counting. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25 squares. In this side, if we square it, five, 10, 15, 20, 25. A squared plus the B squares add up to the same as the C side squares. Yeah? How many of you had your geometry teacher explain the Pythagorean theorem with that diagram? None of them did. I'm sorry you didn't have Mrs. Booth, you should have. This is reality. And this is symbolism, more modern symbolism, that expresses that reality. The trick to doing well in math and actually enjoying math is to not just stop at the surface level of the symbolism and just do number voodoo to things. What you need to do is always keep in mind what these symbols, what these equations literally and physically refer to, what you're actually doing, what these words really mean. And if you keep yourself attached to that and realize this is just a convenient symbolic shorthand, you'll not only understand math better, you will actually enjoy doing math. Pythagoras was one of many founders of philosophical schools in the classical Greek world following the tradition of Thales that was exploring the nature of the physical world around it and trying to describe it in rational ways without recourse to gods and goddesses and supernatural elements. In Pythagoras, his school shrouded in mystery. Uh, we know that they were very interested in mathematics We know he's interested in astronomy. We know he's very interested in music. The Pythagorean school is largely known to us through the descriptions of people that were outsiders to the school or by later descendants of the school. Very little about Pythagoras is known directly. These are mostly legendary uh, tales. But they seem to have been mystics in a lot of ways. Pythagoras uh, believed in reincarnation and the transmigration of souls. Um, he thought that the souls of corrupted humans apparently became animals or beings or lesser things like that. And there's this whole weird thing about why the Pythagoreans, how Pythagoras did not like beans. He was like, had a phobia about beans. Uh, would not eat them. Maybe you know, he thought his flatulence was, you know, corrupt souls coming out of him or something. Uh, this well could be just the, uh, the, the mockery of, of his enemies. Uh, it's hard to know exactly what was his. But uh, the Pythagorean school, developed by Pythagoras, uh, left uh, their hometown and went to the southern uh, coast of Italy, which was controlled by the Greeks at the time. And there he set up the school for which he would be famous. And Pythagoras's accomplishments are many. He's the first one that we know of to teach that the world is round. And everybody that's gone to school and been educated since the days of Pythagoras for the last 2,500 years has learned that the world is round. People didn't really think that Columbus was going to sail off a flat earth. That was a later historical invention. He is the one that gave the name planets to the heavenly bodies that are distinct from the stars because they move on independent paths through the sky. Uh, the word planet is Greek for wanderer, so he distinguished clearly between planets and stars. But his most significant contribution in the long run has to do with the study of music, of sound, and the mathematical structure of it. And his studies begin as he's playing around with something called a monochord. A monochord is a one-stringed musical device 
It's not really used for playing songs on, it's more used for tuning instruments, and he uses it to study sound. And a monochord has two bridges and one string stretched across a, uh, a bass, and it has a movable bridge that can slide back and forth in either direction. And as you move this thing around, the point at which this contacts it means that there are, you can change easily the length of string that you're vibrating when you pluck it. So when it's very near to this side, you're plucking a very tiny bit of string, and then you can move it this way and pluck a longer and longer piece. Music majors out there, as the string gets longer, does the pitch go up or down? The pitch goes down. So when it's very short like this, it's ding, it's very high. As you move it longer, it boom, and it, the pitch drops, okay? So it was understood already that there was a relationship uh, some sort between the length of string under uh, various tensions and the pitch that it would make. But Pythagoras is studying this very carefully, and he makes his most profound discovery. If you pluck a string that is, say, 24 inches long, makes a tone. Bong, call it C. If you take a length of string exactly half that length, 12 inches, under the same tension, and you pluck that note, if this one was a C, what tone does the half length make? C, but an octave higher. It's good. The pitch is going to be doubled. And when you play those two tones together, do they sound good or bad to your ears? They sound good. They make a pleasant uh, combination that we call harmony. Harmony is when two tones are played that make you smile because they sound good together. Why they sounded good together was the mystery. And it doesn't stop there. If you have a length of string that's 16 inches long, they're also going to sound harmonic together. And if you have a length of string that is 18 inches long, and you play it against the 24 inch string, they're going to sound good together. They're going to make harmonies. Pythagoras was looking at these in his own Greek measurements, and he realizes that there is a ratio, a relationship between these. Because it doesn't really matter how many units you call this. It can be inches or feet or quatloos or whatever you want to call them. It doesn't really matter. The point is the relationship or the ratio between them. You learn this as fractions. If you have 24 compared to 12, what does that reduce to? 2 over 1. And if you have 24 compared to 16, what does that reduce to? Find the greatest common factor, 3 over 2. And if you have 24 over 18, what does that reduce to? 4 over 3. These are all very simple fractions. They're easily reduced. You can find that there's a common uh, number, a common length, that will go into both of these evenly and simplify it, showing that they have a simple relationship. This is called a ratio. You call them fractions in school. And Pythagoras realized that there is something uncanny about the way that strings that have simple ratios to each other always sound harmonic. But if you had some other length of string that violated this ratio, if you had something that was, say, you know, 17 and a third inches long, and you play those together, it's not going to make harmony. It's going to sound nasty, and it's going to make an experience called dissonance. Dissonance is when two tones make you frown because they sound bad together. Now, to demonstrate this for the people that didn't have piano lessons or guitar class, I brought in Mr. Guitar. The Greeks had always had this sort of mystical idea about music. They knew that there was something mysterious about the way a song can just change your mood, influence the, the feelings in your soul. They didn't know why, but when you play what we would call today major chords, It's uplifting, it's not triumphant, but change one little tone in that chord, make what we call a minor chord. How does that change the mood? It becomes somber, it becomes sadder, it kind of brings you down. 
So they gave their own names to these uh, different modes, and there were what we would call scales or keys. And if you were wanting something that was uplifting and proper and triumph of the state, you'd play in the Dorian or Ionian mode. If you wanted some kind of wild, you know, dancing and that ecstatic kind of rock and roll feeling, you know, if you're at the Festival of Dionysus, you play songs in the Phrygian mode, sends people into wild madness and stuff. Uh, they even had a god for music, the god Orpheus, as a sort of a demigod who uh, had the, the mystical power of music. And he played so beautifully that... You know, wild animals laid tame at his feet, and stones would weep, and so forth. So they've always had this mystical association. And just like everything else in their world that was described through mythology, the nature philosophers are trying to explain it rationally. And so Pythagoras finds a rational explanation for these different things. Okay? So a, a length uh, of string on a guitar from the bridge to the nut is typically 24 inches. So here is 24 inches of string playing. Okay? This is called the octave fret. When I push down right here, uh, that little piece of metal connects right there, and that is exactly at the 12-inch point from end to end. So I push it here, and I can do what he does on the monochord and play half the length of string. 24 inches, 12. Now I need to play them at the same time so that you can hear the harmony. The tone that I play here, I can also play right there. Here it's the same tone, right? So now I can play them both at the same time. Let's see how it sounds. It's pleasant enough, right? Now if I drop it or raise it a little bit and make it not quite evenly divisible, how's that sound? I can see your eyebrows scrunching up. That sounds nasty or a little bit too high. your stomach just curdling up? Ugh. <sighs> Feel your stomach relax? Okay, so you're responding to harmony and dissonance. And most of you are not music majors, you didn't have extensive music lessons, and yet it didn't matter. You naturally respond to harmony and dissonance in similar ways. It seems to be built into you. And what Pythagoras really found here is that it is actual evidence that he was on the right track that ratios and proportions were really at the basis of the structure of the universe. Ratio is his answer to that question, what is the essence of being? And it's not something material like water or air or theoretical like Aperon's. It was the observation of mathematical ratios, proportions. Ratio is at the base of it all. And if this vibrating length of catgut is obeying precise mathematical laws in creating harmony, then it stands to reason that everything in the universe is behaving according to these mathematical laws. It has a ratio and it sounds beautiful, therefore it sounds beautiful because of the ratios. And everything in the universe must be this way. It doesn't look like that at a glance. You've grown up with the idea that math is you know, the queen of the sciences, the central science and all that. But when you just look out at nature and you see trees and rocks and mountains and rivers, you don't see straight lines and 90 degree angles and, you know, perfect geometrical forms. You see a lot of wild, chaotic looking stuff. So this idea that these mathematical uh, concepts lie at the basis of all the things we observe was, was fairly radical thinking in his day. We've just had 25 centuries to get used to the idea. And it continues with other ratios as well. Uh, this was the halfway point between the two. This is the two-thirds of the way point between the two. And this is the three-quarter point between the two. And these tones always sound good together. This tone is also there. This tone is here. Any combination of those I make always sounds good. So there was a mathematical structure that lies underneath beauty, and it is something that is still with us today. Pythagoras is the one that divided our musical scale in the Western world into the seven tones that we still have it, right? We have A, B, C, D, E, F, G. There's no key of H, right? After G, we start over. So we have a division into seven tones, and then the process starts over again. That's also uh, Pythagoras' work. In the same divisions, 
that he based ancient Greek music on is what we still base it on today. We use modern uh, terminology for music derived from Johann Sebastian Bach, who uh, improved a little bit and tweaked the system, but the same basic structure is there. You still listen to it in popular music that you hear every day. This basic progression, one, four, five, is at the basis of half the songs you've ever heard on the radio in your life. That progression can also be played, and you can slide up and down the neck and play it anywhere. Um, see if y'all know the song. It's a little before your time, I know. Before your time. Okay. Uh, let's go to the 60s. Same chord, same 1 4 5 division. Wild thing. Hey, you got it. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, still a little before your time. Uh, early 80s. Uh, let's see. walking I strut the stuff and I'm so strung out not working either okay. <laughs> all right little Violet Femmes fans in the back all right excellent okay I need something that's going to be universally uh, understandable and enjoyable to you all got it I'm gonna have to switch to minor seventh chords here but the progression is still the same it's gonna be ready Spider-Man, Spider-Man, does whatever a spider can. Spins a web any size, catches thieves just like flies. Look out, here comes Spider-Man. Yeah? Everybody, okay. Mr. Guitar. All right, so what Pythagoras has demonstrated, what he's done that is quite rare for these nature philosophers, is that he actually has found evidence that his theories are on the right track. As you recall, most of these theories of the nature philosophers, the early scientific theories, were intuitive based on the observations of the behavior of nature and then abstracting and extrapolating from that theories that might explain it. What they rarely ever did in the ancient world is get their hands dirty with experimentation and try to demonstrate the theories were right. That's gonna wait till the scientific revolution. So Pythagoras is one of the very, very few people in the ancient world that actually found physical evidence that he was on the right track. Again, if vibrating strings are obeying mathematical laws, probably everything is obeying mathematical laws. And there are two major ways, two major traditions that spring from this, uh, from this influence. Uh, one is in the sciences. Since Pythagoras was able to demonstrate this, carrying on Thales' ideas of the development of abstract math as a body of interrelated theorems. From Pythagoras on, everybody's been pretty convinced in the Western world that math is the key to understanding the universe. We describe math today as the universal language of science. Scientists in different fields, chemistry, astronomy, they can all communicate with each other because they all speak the same mathematical language by which we describe the behavior of the universe. But the other influence of Pythagoras is in the arts. Because he found that when links of string have simple ratios, they sound beautiful to our ears, it stands to reason that those same ratios would look beautiful to the eyes. So Greek architecture tends to follow this tradition, and you'll find that the length to the width of their temples and the ratio of the height to the width, etc., are also rooted in these simple Pythagorean harmonies, these simple ratios. Uh, in their statues. Uh, we'll look at sculpture soon, and we'll see that their statuary also embodies a sense of harmony and balance and proportion as they depict the human form in an idealized way, not how very many humans actually look, but according to how they would ideally look if they were the perfect representations of the human form. The sculpture and the architecture especially takes uh, uh, imparts 
these Pythagorean mathematical qualities. And so Pythagoras was essentially on the verge of showing that the world was rational. And the word rational is literally rooted in the word ratio. A rational world is measurable. A rational world is appealing to the senses. And the qualities that Pythagoras imparted uh, to the ideas of nature are still with us today, even though we've largely forgotten what these words really technically mean. So Pythagoras was pretty excited about all this. And then came a problem. In measuring just the simplest of mathematical forms, he found that there were some things that were really hard to reduce to a ratio. If you take a square and then take the length of its diagonal and try to figure out the ratio between the diagonal to the side of a square, in other words, what unit will evenly divide into each of them, he can never figure it out. No matter how small you divide up, no matter how microscopic you make those lengths of string, you cannot find one unit that will go into both of those. You cannot show that they are commensurable or that they have a ratio between them. And the same thing with the circle. The diameter to the circumference of a circle is also something that you can't reduce and find a basic unit that's going to fit into both. Very frustrating. The Greeks eventually developed a shorthand we still use today. How do we express the uh, incommensurability of the circumference to the diameter? Pi. And what does pi equal? 3.14159265. Wow, you all must have done a lot of geometry to have reduced it down to something that precise. You know, you just, when you hit that on your calculator, that's what pops up, right? Okay, I know. All right, well, this number goes on forever. And it never terminates. It never repeats. It doesn't make a pattern. It just keeps generating number after number, expressing the fact, no matter how tiny you make it, it will never go into both of these. These kinds of relationships, what are they called? What kind of a number is that? That is an irrational number. And for Pythagoras, this is something that is just philosophically repugnant to him. He was right on the verge of demonstrating that the world is rational, it's beautiful, it's harmonic. And then he finds that these simplest of forms have these irrational relationships within them that cannot be expressed. There's a legend that there was a member of the school who were all told, don't tell anybody about this. This was a, a secret of the school. They didn't want people realizing that there were flaws in this beautiful, mystical, rational system. And somebody was blabbing about it too much publicly. And according to legend, they took him out on a boat ride and drowned him and got rid of this guy. Do not spill our mathematical secrets and scandals. Pythagoras is going to be the mathematical thinker that will have the long-term influence uh, from the ancient world. His colleague, Parmenides, took a completely different tack on this. Parmenides decided, following the ideas that everything that our senses tell us uh, is untrustworthy. Water looks blue in the ocean, it's clear when we scoop it up, all the things that our senses lie to us about, and decided that only rational thought could be trusted, and that the world itself was all just illusion. And he had a student named Zeno that tried to prove his master's theories with a series of paradoxes, the most famous of which is the idea of Achilles and the tortoise. Achilles, famous for being a fast runner, racing a tortoise. The tortoise gets a head start. And the idea is that if the tortoise gets a head start on the way to the goal, Achilles can never catch him. Because by the time Achilles gets here, the tortoise will have gone a little further. And by the time Achilles catches up to where the tortoise is now, he'll have gone a little further, and so on. So Achilles can never catch up to the tortoise. He's always catching up to where he was. So that's also a mathematical form of reasoning. But I guarantee if me and Reggie race, and even if he gives me a head start, he's eventually going to blow right by me and get to the finish line. My senses are going to tell me that he races right by me. 
but mathematically I've just shown that he can never catch up to me. So should we trust the rational mind or the illusory world of sense experience? Parmenides argue only the mind can be trusted and everything that you see is most likely an illusion. I see some of you got the point of the question, what movie did he think he lived in? The Matrix. The Matrix. Yeah, basically, Parmenides thought that everything in the physical world was just illusion being sent uh, to our senses in some way and that none of it was trustworthy. What he doesn't realize is that space is not infinitely divisible and eventually he's going to make that distance and pass right by him. But this was the world of mathematics. Remember, you've grown up with this. You're used to the idea that math explains all the world around us. They were just trying to wrestle with this 25 centuries ago in classical Greece. And Pythagoras, to his credit, found the one solid piece of evidence that of all those nature philosophers, his theories were in fact on the right track. He will continue to influence us in other ways. Combining all of these things together, music, mathematics, and astronomy, Pythagoras presents a picture of the world that lasted for a couple of thousand years. He taught that the Earth was round, and in the center of the universe is everybody, almost everybody thought in the ancient world, and that the planets went in perfect circles around us. And if you're looking at the universe as if the Earth is the center point of it, it looks like this would be the order of them. The Moon, Mercury, Venus, the Sun, strange to us, imagine the Sun in the middle of all this, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Moon, Mercury, Venus, Sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. With an outer sphere of stars that tied it all together. When Pythagoras realized that between the Earth and the stars, which all keep their same relative positions, that there were only seven lights up there that were moving independently and seemingly intelligently, he decided that seven must be a special number. And that's why your musical scale got divided into seven tones. He believed that each of these heavenly bodies was sounding one of those tones as they moved through the sky. And if you could go up into the heavens and listen to them, it would make a, a beautiful celestial symphony called the Harmony of the Spheres. An idea that has influenced music for many, many centuries also. Particularly up in the uh, Renaissance and Baroque period, they were trying to recapture something of the harmony of the spheres when they composed music. These uh, seven heavenly bodies, all of these would have been called planets. We'd of course call that a star and that a satellite today. But all of these uh, wonders in the sky gave us our division into seven. Uh, the Babylonians who discovered the same thing decided to have a day of worship uh, for each of these gods in the sky. And they created the seven day week, which the Hebrews absorbed during Babylonian captivity. And you still uh, live with that today. If you look at the heavenly bodies, uh, and look at the names of them, you realize that there's a relationship between them and the days of the week. There's your seven planets under their Latin names, through which we still know them today. And we realize that, hey, this one is still called Sunday. And we still have Moon Day, don't we? Monday. And we still have Saturn's Day, don't we? Saturday. Now, these four in the middle aren't working so well in English, but you Spanish speakers are recognizing the root words, aren't you? Any French speakers out there? But you speak Italian? Okay, so uh, in the Romance languages that many of you speak, and Romance language means it's derived from the Romans or from Latin, the days are still there. So what is the Spanish for Tuesday? Martis, and in French it's Mardi, right? Mardi Gras. Mercury? Mercolus. I took French, so put the French up here. Mercredi, nice. Uh, Jupiter's other name is Jove, which makes it closer. Webus. 
and uh, Venus, I think it's probably known, right? Yes. And Venus, Uranus, and in French, Vendredi. So the French, the Spanish, all the names derived from the Latin still carry these. Now, what happened to these four in the middle is that when Christianity moved to the north of Europe and they began converting Germanic-speaking peoples, one way of sort of easing people into the new religion is to take things that were already familiar to them and borrow it and sort of Christianize it, and that way it sort of eases their uh, movement in there. And so what we end up with are some equivalents. Uh, the Germanic peoples have a god that's similar to Mars. What's, god, uh, what's Mars the god of? Of war. And they have a war god named Q. And Mercury, the messenger of the gods, is also known for his wisdom and cleverness. And who's the Viking god who is the all-knowing all-father? Odin, also called Wotan. Jupiter, what's his weapon? Same guy as Zeus. The lightning bolt. And who's the uh, god of thunder and lightning for the Vikings? You saw his cool movies, right? Thor. And Venus is the goddess of love and fertility. And the Vikings have a fertility goddess named Freya. And that's why in Germanic-speaking Germanic regions, which includes English, which is a dialect of uh, German, we end up with Tuesday, Wotan's Day, Thor's Day, and Freya's Day. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. But they're still linked to the equivalent deities that take us back to the Latin names of these planets. The seven-day week, seven tones of the musical scale, the whole idea of seven being this special, lucky, magical number, the way we make lists of seven things, seven wonders of the world, seven virtues, seven vices, seven deadly sins. This habit of ours of finding seven to be special is all rooted in the observation that of all those lights in the sky, seven of them seem to be doing their own unique thing, guided by their own intelligence. There are seven special wonders up there in the sky looking down on us. And so both the ancient Greeks with Pythagoras and Babylonians observed this, have each contributed something uh, to your modern understanding of the world. So even when you're naming the days of the week, you're linking in to ancient mystical astronomy and mathematical fascination of the nature philosophers.